IT Pro TV, binge worthy learning for IT teams. Why is it binge worthy? It's learning presented in an engaging and entertaining talk show format that beats voice over PowerPoint snooze fests. Watch over 3,300 hours of content in their on demand library on your desktop, on the go, or in the comfort of your own living room. IT Pro TV is IT training you and your team actually want to watch, which means a better return on your learning investment. Get started with IT Pro TV for teams by visiting itpro.tv forward slash security weekly and start a seven-day free trial and get 30% off standard or premium IT Pro TV memberships using the code SECWEEKLY30. The greatest threat to businesses today isn't the outsider trying to get in. It's the people you trust, the ones who already have the keys, your employees, your contractors, and privileged users. 60% of online attacks are carried out by insiders. To stop these insider threats, you need to see what users are doing before an incident occurs. Observe it combats insider threats by detecting risk activity, investigating in minutes, effectively responding, and stopping data lost. Give it a test drive at observeit.com forward slash security weekly. Are you overwhelmed by the sheer volume and noise of alerts? Struggling to define priority while searching for context? Wondering why we're still playing telephone while attackers invest in technology to ease their efforts? It's time to make a stand and demand a different approach. Imagine spending your day doing the valuable work you crave. It's possible today with ServiceNow. Visit servicenow.com forward slash SOAR, that's S-O-A-R, to get more information and make the case for your better approach to security orchestration and automation. Welcome back, everyone, to Enterprise Security Weekly. Make sure you check out our on-demand programming. That's securityweekly.com forward slash on-demand. Essentially, it's a bunch of pre-recorded webcasts with great information that you can go register for. Uh, we worked with a number of our sponsors to put together some fantastic content. It's usually the first half is Security Weekly talking about a topic um, and going into uh, the in-depth about the problems and solutions associated with that topic and then the sponsor adding on their thoughts about the problem and solution as well. Securityweekly.com forward slash on demand. Check it out. Also, we will be at Source Boston uh, May 9th through the 10th. I'll be speaking there. You can go to sourceconference.com, um, get the uh, speaker schedule, among other things, there, and use a discount code that saves you $75 off. That's SW75. Uh, I can't read that. Uh, w M. It's, uh, I got it. I got it. Got it. It's S W seventy five W M K W. So Sierra whiskey seventy five whiskey Mike ki uh, kilo whiskey. Thank you. Now I want whiskey. <laughs> 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 so uh, <clears throat> this book, the Phoenix Project. Um, we've uh, actually interviewed Gene Kim on the show uh, a while back uh, about the book. Uh, Gene Kim, Kevin Bear. And George Spafford are the authors of this fantastic book, which if you haven't read it, I will try not to give you any spoilers uh, during this segment and talk more at a high level because uh, there are spoilers to be had and I want you to enjoy uh, the book. Uh, it does have my resounding endorsement, I'm sure Keith uh, as well, uh, for a book that everyone in our field and even IT should absolutely read without question. Um, and it's told in a narrative, which is, which is different. I mean, most of us read you know, a book, nonfiction book, uh, and it's not told in the form of a story or narrative, but uh, Gene and team uh, drew inspiration from a previous book about lean manufacturing called The Goal, and a lot of it is applying those manufacturing uh, techniques for process engineering and lean manufacturing, applying that to IT, and they did so in a story, which I think is great the way they presented it in the story, and they worked really hard uh, on building characters in the story, having a protagonist, having the Oracle or Kung Fu master character in the book. And just all of the characters are people you relate to. And they'll remind you of people that you've worked with over uh, your career. I promise you'll feel like, you know, all of these characters in the book. Um, and it's called the Phoenix project. So uh, again, it was five years ago. They're working. They actually have released the beyond the Phoenix project, which is an interview uh, with Gene Kim and John Willis, uh, kind of an, an interview talking about the concepts in the book. Uh, and th that's kind of how it set it up. Keith, I want to get your, your thoughts. Uh, we haven't really talked in depth about our kind of experience before the show. We shared some stories about the book, uh, keeping in mind, we don't want any spoilers. Uh, you know, wh what do you recommend, uh, for the Phoenix project? Like who should read it and why and all that stuff? 
So the answer is who should read it is yes, uh, everybody. Uh, and, and the reason that I always say everybody should read it though is, is it's funny. I, I talk to a lot of my colleagues, my friends, both developers, security practitioners, heck, even my wife, right? Yeah. And I like to say, if you want to see how like a, a business operation works and the IT operation works at an organization, read the Phoenix Project. And if you want to see how development is thought of and treated by the business, how security is thought of and treated by your peers within the business, uh, or at least how they they can be perceived, uh, and and sometimes how other parts of the business will try to undercut you. Um, yeah, read read the Phoenix Project because it will give you insights. It'll make you laugh. It'll make you cry. Uh, you will be like, yes, I have lived that moment, mm -hmm. uh, especially about the laptop. Uh, I, I won't say any more about it other than oh, the laptop itself. is The, the laptop sub-narrative is perhaps one of my favorite like sub-storylines uh, in the book. It, it just it makes me laugh. Uh, just even thinking about it now, it makes me laugh hysterically. Uh, also, I think if you're, you are a security professional today uh, or an aspiring security professional that when you look at the security character in the book, you're going to have some strong thoughts and opinions. <laughs> I'll leave it at yeah. that. I don't want to spoil it, but you're going to have some strong thoughts uh, and opinions. It's kind of one of my, it could be a beef that I have with the book, but it all works out in the end. So, I would say that honestly, it's funny. I don't, I think for most organizations, it's perhaps a little bit played up, but it is actually how security is perceived because quite frankly, for years, it's how some security professionals have behaved. Uh, I'm not going to get into, into details on it, but uh, effectively, I'll leave it at the summary of security is often been thought of as the the part of the organization that says no mm -hmm. to everything. Uh, and and the, they play that up quite a lot in the book. And I think that security now, especially with the whole idea of DevOps, we have a, a very unique opportunity to become a part of the process in a way that we can say yes, and we can say yes and win. Um and actually, it's funny because I was planning to talk more about this, specifically DevOps versus DevSecOps, on Application Security Weekly this week. So mm -hmm. uh, folks can tune into that and, and get a good conversation on that now, as well. But Keith, have you read the DevOps Handbook? I have. In fact, I'm rereading it right now. It's funny. Okay. Uh, at the so, end of InfoSec World, I started rereading it. Now, in terms of order, so we've mentioned three books so far. We've mentioned The Phoenix Project uh, by Gene Kim and others that I mentioned. We've mentioned The Goal, uh, which is by... Elihu Goldrat and Jeff Cox. And, and that book is the one about more about manufacturing. The same, it's kind of like a, a parallel universe to the Phoenix Project. It's the same similar kind of narrative uh, that they pay homage to in the Phoenix Project, but set in the setting of a manufacturing plant. And so Gene actually recommends you read the goal first. And I wish I had heard Gene's recommendation to do that because I probably would have read them in the order of uh, the goal first, and then then the Phoenix Project, then the DevOps Handbook, or do you reverse the last two, do you think, Keith? See, what I would do is, I would suggest this, right? So you listen to your Security Weekly podcasts on your ride into work in the morning, uh, and then on your ride home, listen to the DevOps Handbook, and then before you go to bed, sit down and read a little bit of the Phoenix Project. Just pull it up on your phone, yeah. uh, you know, use Kindle or what have you, and, and read it for 10 or 15 minutes. The chapters are super short yeah, yeah, okay. uh, and consumable. And that will give, so between listening to the news of the Security Weekly Network, getting a little bit of the DevOps process on your ride home, and then laughing about it at the end of the day by being yeah. like, yep, I've seen that. I just experienced that problem today. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, it, it will make you well-rounded. I say reading them in tandem. The goal itself, I think, is going to be better for IT practitioners uh, working in traditional environments today. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much it would apply to those organizations that are abundantly moving to the cloud. I would say that the DevOps handbook is probably going to be better because it actually, it makes a lot of allusion to uh, the concepts of manufacturing and the ways that you can apply those concepts to IT or, or even development work today, uh, which actually it, it's probably a nice segue into uh, the four kinds of work which yes. I think is is really important. Paul, do you want to cover what those are? It's probably the most universal lesson that you get from the book, in my opinion, because uh, as you said, you know, you, you want your wife to read the book. I can apply these concepts to work in my house, in managing the household, uh, managing the work here for our podcast productions, and helping uh, enterprise security and IT teams as well. So I think it's one of the most universal messages when they define the four types of work. And it's kind of, it's somewhat of a spoiler. So like, if you want to 
like tune out at this point. Like we're going to just briefly talk about the four types of work. Um, but it's kind of a critical moment in the book. If you don't know what the four types of work are, learning them by reading the book is way more entertaining than just hearing Keith and I kind of just rattle them off right here. So it's kind of somewhat of a spoiler. I just want to give everyone a, an opportunity if you want to fast forward or whatever, go read the book and then come back to you know this point in the show. Um, so the first type of work are business projects, right? Those are the projects that support the business, business functions, business operations, and help the business make money. Business projects. Yes, yeah, they're, they're, they're features. They're getting the servers spun up. They're launching uh, the website, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Those are the business projects. And then there are the internal projects, which as Gene describes, are those things, projects that you do, but outside of IT, no one really notices like that, they're, that it's right. happening, right? It's like, we need to upgrade the SAN or you know, we need to add more capacity to the network and deploy some new switches and routers uh, in order to like get to the next step. And it, so all of those internal projects uh, that really don't have much or any visibility outside uh, of IT is kind of how I classify them. Would you agree with that, Keith? Yeah, those are the PowerShell scripts that you write to automate patching a certain piece of software across your organization, yeah. right? That's that's the kind of internal project that it will take some time up front to develop and to test. But once you have it, it will uh, make your lives easier overall. Yeah. So uh, to put it in the Security Weekly example, right, we have software we use to publish all of our shows. Uh, a business project would be allowing the host to add content uh, into that system and associate it with all of our shows, right? Today, we use a wiki. We actually just whiteboarded out some uh, process improvements to use our internal software for that purpose. An operational change would be, I need to put an air conditioner in the server room so that our equipment doesn't overheat while we're doing a broadcast, right? That's typically something that you wouldn't notice on the show. None of the other hosts would really notice. No one outside of our internal IT department would notice that type of project. Um, and actually, operational change is the third kind of work. So yes. uh, that's exactly it. Is it's it's the sort of thing where um, so in order for you to update uh, the server room, for example, you might have to shut down those systems while you install the new air conditioning unit because you they, you know someone has to go in there and work and you don't want them to trip over the cables. That is an operational change. So having change control, for example, to yes. say, okay, when are we recording all of our shows? how long is it going to take us to use that server room to actually like take everything that we have put together, package it all up. Uh, and then, okay, what is, where are our change control windows? And you're right. Like I wouldn't notice any of that because I don't work in the office. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, I just come onto these shows and get to talk and have fun. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's one of those things that it's an operational change, but it leads to change control. So identifying windows of change control. And then, of course, who is going to be impacted by the changes that you are making. Right. And also, um, what changes are you making? Uh, why are you making those changes? And what's your back out plan? And, and that's what I instantiated here, because uh, actually we had a lot of operational hiccups. And I was like, okay, when we do changes, I want you to be able to make changes. However... You got to write up that change first. You got to tell me what you're changing, why you're changing it, what you're changing. And most importantly for me is what's your backup plan for changing it. And I, my expectation is that not every change, once you instantiate that process, is going to go off without any errors or hiccups or, or issues, right? There absolutely will be, which is why you have a backup plan. And the problem that you run into is when you go make changes and you haven't notified everyone and you don't have a backup plan, things go bad and then things are really bad. And then you're in the fourth category of work, which we're trying, which we're going to describe, which is where you don't want any work to happen. Or if it does, you want it to be planned. Um, so uh, uh, the changes are important to have a process around, not so much so that there's never an issue, but when there is an issue, it's, you're not, no one's in trouble is what I tell them. Like, as long as you submitted a change control request, I don't care if you broke something and set it on fire. You had a backup plan. You initiated it. I knew why you were making the change and, and you're trying. That's the important thing with uh, change control, in my opinion. And I would say operational changes are the sort of things that you can justify to the business and say, okay, we need to make this change. And therefore, these, these are like the plans and the, the timing of it is just as important, uh, which actually brings us to the, the fourth type of work, which is unplanned work, uh, which in this case, I, I like to say, it's the unknown unknowns. You can't anticipate that they will happen, mm. but when they do, they will literally throw your entire workflow uh, into the trash because they need to be addressed right away. 
um, whether that's the fan goes offline or, <laughs> uh, you know, email services are down or a database is corrupted and you can no longer accept orders, right? Um, unplanned work is, I, I like to say, if you build in planned time for unplanned work into your, your calendar or your schedule, so you have a, you've padded maybe 20% time to deal with unplanned work, it allows you to take that time to then perhaps work on internal projects if no unplanned work happens. Mm -hmm. But if unplanned work does happen, then you actually have time it built into your, your schedule that you can shift things around appropriately so that you're not interrupting business projects or internal projects right. to deal with it. The danger of unplanned work is that all other work has essentially stopped and everyone's working on the unplanned work. And if there's too much unplanned work, then nothing else gets done. Uh, and that's the worst possible scenario. Uh, and so minimizing unplanned work or turning unplanned work into planned work, uh, I think it's very much in the same vein of uh, the Netflix when they released their uh, open source like Chaos Monkey kind of thing where they're like basically things go into our system and they purposely break things to make sure that we're more resilient. That's a, probably the best example of turning unplanned work into planned work so that there never is truly any unplanned uh, events happening. It's how they effectively forced uh, their organization to architect for unplanned work in, in ways that they could deal with effectively. So it, it's interesting because all of this actually leads to a, another book that's part of kind of the same family of books. Uh, so the goal of the DevOps Handbook, the Phoenix Project, is a book called Making Work Visible. Because uh, especially in IT, and they cover this in the DevOps Handbook pretty well, is no one really has an idea of what you are doing as an IT operations team. So you're not seen as producing value for the organization, which is often why teams like security are seen as an inhibitor rather than an enabler within mm -hmm. an organization. So if you can make your work visible by having something like a Kanban board or Trello, or as they, as they kind of do in the Phoenix project is, you know, they literally use an actual board mm -hmm. uh, that they have. Um, and I don't want to give any more detail about how that board works for them. And, and you can, it, for those of that are familiar with Kanban, you already know. Uh, but to that end, having, you know, a card on your board that is unplanned work, it is literally like in there ready to go. Yep. So you can just switch it and say that block right there is for unplanned work and this is the unplanned work. So we're going to go do it. Mm -hmm. Um, it, that's, that will help make your organization uh, provide value visibly. And it's interesting because I'm also reading a, another book as well. This is just the, you know, the book edition of Enterprise Security Weekly called uh, How to Measure Anything. And it, it deals with this very concept of, first of all, you need to be able to measure it to show the value to the organization or to the business. And so having a visible workload or a visible workflow that you can show where things stand uh, will will add a lot of value to a lot of organizations because simply when you realize how much work you have or how much work is currently in flight, you realize that you can't have that much in flight because it leads to unplanned work. Uh, one of the, when they start transitioning in the book to talking more about the DevOps process, uh, a couple of things. I feel today, like I feel like the book was almost five years before its time uh, or maybe four years, right? Um, because the tools we have today can implement better the processes and methodologies described in the DevOps process. And I think we've really seen not just a progression in security. I think security is looked upon differently five years later. I also think that uh, the tools and practices available for Docker, for example, Kubernetes, uh, much more lend itself to implementing that DevOps process. Uh, and, and really one of the realizations for me about DevOps that I took from the book was it's that blending of infrastructure along with all of your software and code. And I, I never understood the problem in, you know, from that perspective uh, until I, I really read the book. And I thought about, I was like, wow, I've experienced like pre-DevOps and, and post-DevOps. And in pre-DevOps world, I was actually a sysadmin supporting a Java application, speaking of Java, <laughs> on the previous segment. Right. And development would get done with their code and then they would hand it off not to QA, they'd have to hand it off to me, the sole systems administrator, and say, Paul, we have a new release. And by the way, you need to change this configuration on the app server. You need to implement this database schema change. Uh, you need to make this configuration to the web server. And I basically have to go rebuild the environment uh, to get it into QA. And then hope 
that whoever was implementing it in production, if it wasn't me, also made those same changes. And I was like, wow, I've, I've lived that and I've seen the disastrous consequences that can happen when infrastructure changes don't follow along a software release. It basically means the software doesn't work. Um, the DevOps model blends that infrastructure change and IT and sysadmin changes right into the development process. And I was like, wow, that's how we go from one commit every six months into production to 10 commits a day. It's because all those changes are just following where you're deploying software. And I realized that with Docker, I'm like, I don't have to worry about like, how do I keep dev and QA in production all like, I'm just deploying software and my infrastructure is just following it right along. I'm like, this is great. Uh, and so that was one of the big kind of uh, insights that it gave into me. I kind of knew about that concept, but it really put it into perspective for me about how your infrastructure should essentially be part of your software releases. The analogy that they use in the DevOps handbook that I really like is the whole concept of batch sizing too. So uh, for example, what they, what they give as the example is they say, okay, you have to send a mailer out to uh, you know, 30 people. And so uh, you're going to ha obviously have envelopes that need to be addressed. You're going to be printing this mailer uh, individually kind of addressed and folding it up appropriately and then stuffing the envelopes and then mailing them. Uh, well, if you do that in a large batch size where you're folding the letters and then, uh, you know, you're stuffing them in the envelopes, uh, after all the letters are folded, but you realize after you've printed the 10th one and you start doing some folding that there's a problem with the letter, mm -hmm. like you now have to go reprint 10 letters. And so they say, if you can reduce the batch size to the smallest possible batch, which is why you get 10 commits or 10 pushes to production a day where you print one letter you fold one letter, you put it in the envelope, and then you mail it, and that you know that the letter is printed correctly, the folding sizes are folded appropriately for the envelope, the addressing system is actually working appropriately, and you can ship it, you can ship a lot faster. And the time uh, reduction of, you know, wait three months to send this mailer to wait 10 minutes to send this mailer yep. uh, suddenly makes things a lot faster. And as the customer, you get delivery of your, your asks or your requests a lot faster. One of the things in the Beyond Phoenix Project book, and it was a concept that I immediately applied to the software we're designing here for Security Weekly was, uh, along with, with your example, if you're sending on a mailer, you don't want work to go into the system that is incomplete, that's missing. So in your example, like if, I don't, if I'm not running out of stamps, I'm not being very effective sending my mailer. You got to make sure that you have the stamp, the envelope, the letter, uh, and everything you need before that order goes into the system. And that's something I believe they took from Toyota uh, or, or some manufacturing plant that when they released work, before they released work on a physical cart in the manufacturing plant, all of the stuff had to be there to complete the order from step zero all the way to completion. If you release work into the system before it has some of those pieces that it needs, it's going to come back and that's bad. You want work to go through the system once uh, and be on a continuous delivery, much like we do in DevOps. It's a continuous delivery. We're not going back and making a change or getting something and then pushing it back. We're just constantly pushing forward. In our processes oh. here, I was like, wow, that's, I'm like, that's one of our problems that we have. Um, it, and for example, like if a guest comes on the show, we need to have all that guest information so that we can process that guest through the system so they have a great experience coming on the show. If the Skype ID is missing from that person and they get pushed into the system, then the next person in line is like, well, I don't know how to contact them. And then they have to kick it back and then it goes back and forth and then it's not efficient at all. And so that was one really good point that I think I didn't fully grasp until Gene was talking about it in the, the Beyond the Phoenix project. In, in the same light, they also talk about, uh, for the Toyota example, the idea of work centers. And so... Uh, effectively pushing up everything up to the bottleneck and you have to identify your one bottleneck because effectively all processes, all organizations, all um, you know development models and what have you has one bottleneck effectively. And in some cases in the book, it was it happened to be uh, one of the characters. I'm not going to name who, but it comes out pretty quickly as who that was. So to that end, you you can identify, okay, our one bottleneck is getting people Skype names, right? So if we can get everybody Skype names, the rest of it is easy. Then you've identified the problem and the work flows smoothly from start to finish. But otherwise, if it hits a bottleneck and it waits, work piles up at that work center until Correct. eventually it gets it. And then everyone downstream gets affected by the abundance of work that is now hitting them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a fascinating concept from all these concepts from, from engineering, 
for sure, in how they apply to all types uh, of work. So, and you may be surprised, what I was going to say is you may be surprised what your constraint actually is. And, and there's some examples, I think, both in the book and in the follow on the Beyond the Phoenix Project that when you look at a, a, a process and you're trying to identify what the problem is, you probably have in your mind what you think the constraint is. But as you work through it, a lot, they give a lot of example or a good example in the Beyond Phoenix Project that it, it wasn't what we thought. Like they thought the constraint in the one example that Gene was giving um, – they thought the constraint was, well, they, this was a mainframe application, right? And it turned out to be something completely different. I think it was the same thing for us. Once we whiteboarded some stuff out, we recognized that our constraints really weren't people. They were some of the different technologies. And by adjusting those, you can fix some of your constraints. So what you think your constraints are, aren't necessarily your constraints until you get the team together and, and, and work it out. Yeah. And to that end, and especially in development or in IT operations or in security, those constraints could be any number of things, right? It could be, some people will say it's, uh, our constraint is budget. And I'll tell you now, hint, it's never budget, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's either approval processes. Uh, so we, you know, we see it a lot where it ends up being legal. Legal is actually sometimes the hurdle to adopt a, a product, adopt a, a new process, etc. So making sure you identify those bottlenecks early, you work with those parties to actually get those bottlenecks addressed early, uh, you can eventually, you know, just streamline the entire process start to finish. And then, hey, maybe now you have uh, a new process in place or some new technology that will enhance your ability to deliver uh, to your organization. What I also found in, in kind of the last point um, on this book, and obviously, Keith and I have gained some great insights from it, uh, and it has a resounding endorsement. Um, it, earlier on in the book, they talk about when work should be released into the system. And I think this is a universal thing that crosses manufacturing, IT, security. And the, the uh, Oracle character is probing the, the protagonist. And it's like, well, when do you think, like, how do they know which orders to release? And what's that based on? And you might think, well, you know, like when I get the work, I'll funnel it in. I'll work on what's the highest priority. I'll work on uh, who's screaming the loudest. I'll work on what makes us the most money. And it turns out like it's none of those things. And I, that was one of the uh, great things I learned from the book that you balance work going into the system based on your constraints. And whatever that constraint is, whatever makes them work more efficiently, that's how you release work into the system is based upon your constraints within the system. And I won't give it away. They go into a lot more detail uh, in the book. And quite frankly, I'm still trying to figure out how that applies to some of my various situations that I'm applying this methodology to. But I definitely think differently about releasing work into the system, that it's not about even time uh, of, of the due date that may be arbitrarily attached to that work. It's all about what makes my constraints work most efficiently, whether that's a person, a, a machine, whether it's software, wherever it is that you've identified as your constraint. So uh, I thought that was one of the great lessons from the book, to be honest with you. I, and agreed. I mean, I, I was going to say, I, in this case, like constraints could be people, constraints could be technology, constraints could be visibility, right? But Ultimately, you need to know visibly what your constraints are going to be uh, going into that process. So investing the time up front to identify constraints, identify bottlenecks, uh, constraints in this case, uh, identify the multiple projects that are going on, making them all visible, and then uh, identifying priorities appropriately and, and releasing that work based on those constraints will make your processes as a security team, an IT operations team, and ultimately as a business that much smoother. And, you know, I, I think it, uh, at home, I came up with some, you know, a great example of that, right? Um, kids, you don't, you don't have kids yet. Um, I have three kids. Uh, and you realize this when you, when you have kids, especially as you get more and more kids, um, that when you go take on a house project, right? Like, whatever it is, it could be fixing something, it could be redoing something, it could be a small project that takes a couple hours, it could be a project that takes an entire weekend. You as parents are some of the constraints in your system you're working on a project, that means your other operational projects, such as laundry, dishes, and cleaning, that stuff starts to stack to the ceiling. Like it's a very visual depiction in your mind when you read the book about, they give the example of inventory piling to the ceiling in a manufacturing plant. And I was telling my wife, I'm like, it's the same thing. That's why when I'm working on a project, these other things are piling to the ceiling and we need to balance, you know, our constraints with these various projects. That kind of helped me put that in perspective 
uh, you know, we've got a lot to take care of at our house. So when a primary resource is off working on a project, that means the other stuff is going to fall behind. And just even recognizing that, I think alleviates a lot of the friction that you might have of, oh my God, there's like 18 loads of laundry to do. It's like, well, yeah, okay, we expect that. We know that that was going to happen because, you know, we took on this other project. So uh, I, I this, uh, that visual of inventory piling to the ceiling is not just a visual that you would see in the cards they had on the table, in the book, in the manufacturing plants, um, but also in your own IT organizations. You know you have this list of projects and work is piling to the ceiling. And I think that one of the things you'll glean from this book is how to get control of that. Uh, I think that's one of the main reasons why they wrote the book was we suffer from that problem in IT and security in a big way. We want to implement all these things and we can't get out of our own way and therefore stuff is stacking to the ceiling. So, And as in IT and at home, the best way to deal with your dirty laundry is small batch sizes. Small batch sizes. I agree. I agree. I need to dockerize my laundry. <laughs> that's a great title for the episode, dockerizing your laundry. <laughs> yes, I agree. So make sure you go check out the Phoenix Project. Um, the uh, link, it's actually spelled wrong in the title. I got to fix that. Um, the uh, link to the Phoenix Project, the goal, and the DevOps handbook uh, are three of the primary books we talked about in this segment. If you go to wiki.securityweekly.com, this is episode 85 of Enterprise Security Weekly. You can get a link to those. I listened to, uh, I'm a huge audiobook fan. Uh, my kids are not a huge fan of the Phoenix Project. My five-year-old boy, he thought it was pretty boring. My nine-year-old didn't think it was too bad. Like he, he kind of got some of the stuff. He was laughing at some of the laptop things that Keith and I alluded to uh, earlier. And there would be a lot of uh, negotiating going on. And they're like, Daddy, you don't, we don't want to listen to the book. Like, really? I'm like, I'm going to stop at McDonald's and get you a McFlurry. And they're like, all right, you can put your book on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what happens as a parent. Eventually, you just kind of succumb to the idea that you have to bribe your children to, <laughs> to do what you need to do. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, because reading time for me is, is hard to come by. Uh, so I maximize the time in the car and I, I, I enjoy it. Now, I have to say, the person who reads the audiobook version um, is not, to, in my opinion, not at the same level as the content in the book and the materials that the authors put together. Wasn't the worst uh, um, reader, um, uh, uh, narrator uh, of a book that I've listened to, uh, but wasn't the best either. So uh, that's just my honest, uh, my honest feedback. Um, I, I've listened to books where the narrator has been better, let's put it that way. Uh, it didn't so much detract from the experience. Obviously, I still got a lot out of the book, but uh, wasn't a huge, huge fan of the narrator. But he did an okay job. Yeah, for me, I, I'm a, a screen reader, so I read The Phoenix Project on my phone, uh, ironically, as I would mm -hmm. travel on the train uh, back and forth to work when I was at Rapid7, and sure. then I ended up reading the DevOps Handbook on my Kindle. Mm -hmm. So, Awesome. Well, Keith, thank you so much for uh, filling in for Mr. John Strand this week, and thank you everyone for listening and watching. We'll see you next time. <laughs>